So today we're going to start, uh, there will be some parallel sessions and I'll explain that later on um, before the break. And I'll also have Hong explain a little bit about the logistics for today. Um, but before that, uh, we're gonna get started with a, a nice session I think you'll all enjoy. I had a look at the feedback, another look at the feedback yesterday. And a lot of you were requesting to learn about the new features in DHIS2. Um, so Lars is a, an expert in all of these new features and he's very good at uh, kind of explaining these to everyone. So we're gonna give him an opportunity to walk us through um, all of these different features. And of course, um, you know, it's just a quick demonstration. If you want to know more about any of the specific features that he's presented, we have all of the his groups here that presented yesterday, um, and we're all happy to talk to you about those and discuss with you how to implement those in your own settings and, and you know, learn about how to utilize those features in practice. Okay. So for those of you online, as well as um, here, we're going to start the session today as a joint session. Um, where Lars is going to present on all the various uh, new and exciting things that are happening in DHIS2. So I'll just hand it over to him and he'll walk you through all the demonstrations. All right, guys, uh, good morning. Um, can you hear me well in the back? Yeah. <laughs> all right, guys, I hope, hope everyone had a, a good night to sleep uh, because we're gonna have a lot of things to, to cover today. We're going to talk about the um, some of the new things we've been working on in DHS2 over the last um, last year or so, <clears throat> and um, we have a lot of cool new stuff. And we're going to have questions in the end, so please take some notes um, and ask questions towards the end. It's totally fine. We have a lot of time, so uh, so don't be shy. We're going to talk about um, the different types of products that we have inside DHS2. Um, which we call the platform um, side of things. We have analytics. There's uh, tracker, Android. Um, and then finally questions. And then if you have some time at the end, we're gonna talk about a um, little bit of the roadmap. Let's see, let's see how much time we got. So um, we're gonna kick it off with the um, data entry side of things. So in 239, we have finally managed to make a new uh, data entry application. Um, so data entry is, as you probably know, uh, maybe the first uh, module that we had in DHS2. Um, it's been with us for many, many years, and it was about time to kind of re-implement and, and rethink a little bit. So, so we added um, <laughs> we added a new uh, module now based on the new technology stack that we have in DHS2, uh, based on React, as we say. Um, what is that? Sorry. Okay. It's based on the new technology stack, new look and feel that we have in DHS2. Um, we have a new um, sort of UX layout also in the system. So everything looks much better now. Um, we have what we call always visible data set and period selection. We're making the data set and all these selections. We're making them available at all times. So it's easy to use. Uh, um, we have an organic filter now, which we're going to talk about, which makes it much easier to understand which um, sort of organics are linked to, to the data sets that you have selected. There's a new panel on the right side for, for things like details and comments and min max and so on. Um, we have very prominent data validation now. So we're focusing more on the data validation side of things. And we have improved uh, the offline experience. So it's easier to work offline. Data is automatically pushed up to the server once you get back, uh, back online. So let's have a look. So first of all, first of all we have Okay, so we have um, always visible selection at the top. So this is a new layout of the, of the, of the app. So we can see at the top there, we have data set selection, um, organic period, these things are, are always visible. So let's, let's jump to a demo. So if you go to the application, you will see that there's a new app called Data Entry Beta. We call it beta now because it's still kind of being, being tested. Um, so you start by selecting a data set from here. Um, then you select an organic. Uh, you can select a period, and here comes the form. So the cool thing now is that everything up here is always visible. So even if you, even if you scroll down, you can see that the, the selection there is always visible at the top, like this. Okay. So I can go here, and then even if I scroll down, I can see still which period, which organic, etc. Um, we also have a filter by dataset. So many people have told us that you would like to be able to filter the facility. 
sometimes there's a lot of facilities you don't know you don't want to see all of them you only want to see the ones where um you know this particular person is, is actually working so if there's a hiv officer or, or program data entry staff uh working to end data then we would only like to see the, the facilities which actually provide hiv services and so on so now we have a filter so that you can only see the hierarchy basically the uh, facilities which actually have this data set so once we go here now we select a child health you can go ahead and see and we have you can see that all the facilities which don't provide the you know immunization services and nutrition services they can now uh, be grayed out uh, instead and so we can easily see which of the uh, facilities actually provide the service we don't have to go around them and uh, and um, you know look for those and this we hope also helps to this whole multiple hierarchy discussion that we now is maybe making it easy to see which facilities are actually active for that particular person we're trying to do something similar on the uh, visualization side so that you can actually also do the same there is to filter all the facilities uh, but we're still working on that um, to, to see what's what's uh, most most feasible to do. Just need to wait a okay. It keeps on switching off whenever. Uh, yeah, sorry. Okay. We also have a details side panel. So if you look on the right side, there will be a, a new details panel there. So uh, we have things like the history, min max, audit log, change log, etc. On on the right side. Let's have a look. Um, once again, we, we select, uh, or we can go here. We can we can look at the form. We can now go to a particular cell in the form. And we can say view details, um, and then we get like details about this particular um, value. We have the information up here on the, on the right. On the right, where we can see name, um, description, you know, code, data element, etc. Here we can put comments, so we can we can add a comment to the value. We have min and max limits right here. We can go in and change those. Um, and then we can save. Down here, we have the, what we call the history chart. So there's a small chart that shows you the, the, the history of this value. So you can easily see the trends um, and see if this value looks reasonable. Is it very high compared to the last 13 months um, or very low? <clears throat> and then finally, we have the uh, audit log. So you can see here all the change logs. So you can see here all the changes to this value. And we improve the user interface so you can see you know what the value used to be and then what the value is now so it's easy to see kind of the history of this value to understand uh, what this value been through and all of this is inside the same screen so we don't have to kind of have this blocking dialogue that we had before so it's now uh, available straight in the ui and we can then tap along to the next value and everything changes like this i can go and look at the history here while while keeping my form open <clears throat> We also have uh, validation in the sidebar with priority. So you can now look at validation rules straight inside the main screen without having to have this dialog. So if you go here to the, the form, you can go down here and say run validation um, and now get a validation summary on the left, on the right. So we have you know, high priority alerts, medium priority alerts uh, on the right. Um, we can see easily without leaving the screen what the validation problems are. This we also have uh, grouping by priority. So there's you know, high priority, medium priority, and low priority. So you can set this by validation rule now to understand what are the most important ones. We're also working on this now to make this more intelligent so that you don't actually have to click uh, validation. You can just go, uh, hopefully, in the next person. We will run this automatically. So at, at sort of smart, smart uh, intervals um, to make data validation even more prominent in the, in the user. And then um, we also work with the offline support here. So now in the old um, application, you have to go and click, you know, sync to server essentially. Now we have uh, made this automatic. So this, you can only just, you know, there's nothing you need to do. You can just wait. And then once, once you get back online, then the data will sync automatically back to the server. So you don't need to kind of go there and, and, and press anything. Uh, it's, it's all automatic. So. We have this little icon on, on, the, on the bottom right that tells you that now the data is synced. Pretty much like Google Docs has seen that one. Um, and we also made it possible to actually close and open the browser, even if you're offline. That didn't work in the old uh, module. So now you can just go and uh, close your browser, reboot your laptop, go back to the data entry module, and then continue where you left off, all being offline. 
So this will help will make life easier when it comes to uh, working offline, which many of you do in, in the facilities. Okay. So that was the um, that was the data entry module. Um, you can have a look. It's all under the play environment for DHS2. So you can go there and have a look for yourself if you want to play around. Okay, so shifting gears a little bit, we have uh, made a new solution for what they call version update notifications. So we know that a lot of you um, struggle with actually updating the server, um, partly because it's painful, of course. I mean, you need to test, you need to retrain, and all these things. But we also now have at the core team, we also do what they call patch releases, right? So patch releases is essentially like the major version dot something. So we have um, you know, 38.1, 38.2, and all these things. So there's always like a patch version for every major version. And we do recommend that you always stay up to date um, on this um, major version, right? So that you don't far too far, far, far behind because we always release, you know, bug fixes, security fixes, minor performance improvements. So please try to stay up to date to the minor versions on whatever patch, major version you're in. Uh, we also know that many people don't really, um, and they're not really aware of the, the patch versions and also the security fixes. We do release like these things we call hot fixes, which is essentially like quick fixes to security uh, problems. So um, every time there's a security problem, we do re release a hot fix that we do recommend it. Now we have this integrated solution into DHS2, which actually sends you a message every time there's a new version for whatever major version you have. So, if you are on 237 um, and we have a hotfix there, you will now get a message in your inbox um, that tells you that, okay, there's a new version available now for, for 237. And we do recommend that you upgrade. Um, and this is sent um, as a normal message to the messaging system that we have. And we have, um, you need to have the all authority or there's a special user group called message recipients. So there's a special user group that you can configure in the settings app. Uh, to control which um, which um, you know user groups should be able to receive these things. So it looks like this is a new system category in the messaging app that, where you can go and, and get these uh, messages. Okay, so switching gears a bit, um, we're also working a lot on scalability of DHS. So in two thirty eight or actually two thirty eight and nine. We added a new solution for what they call dynamic cluster cache management. And this applies to those of you who actually run DHS2 in the cluster. Um, so if you have many servers, as they call it, or many Tomcat um, servers running DHS2, then you now, you now made it much easier to actually update uh, these, these systems. So prior to this, you had to actually go and configure every node in your cluster and make them aware of all of the other nodes, especially in the other nodes. Now in 239, uh, this is all automatic. So there's no need to go and configure. Sorry, it keeps cutting out. But you need to keep the list. Okay. Um, okay, so you need to go and uh, there's no need now to go and uh, configure every node in the cluster. You can just have it automatic. So you just point every node to the shared Redis instance, and it will automatically be picked up in the cluster. There's no need to go and change all the other nodes in the cluster. So that means we can now do what they call um, dynamic scaling. You can add nodes, uh, meaning like Tomcat instances, essentially. And you can remove nodes uh, without really touching the other ones in the cluster. And this really simplifies if you want to scale up and have multiple servers, multiple Tomcat installations. Um, and it also helps if you're running things like Kubernetes or what they call like server orchestration uh, systems um, to actually run a more scalable, more dynamic cluster in the cloud. In your, in your own uh, hardware. So this, this is maybe a little bit complicated or, or, or uh, complex, but it's all described in the documentation. So you can go and tell your sysadmin to, to have a look and just basically tell him that it's easy now to run a, run a cluster. Okay. Um, we also made a lot of improvements to what we call the data store API. Uh, this is a bit for developers, but um, we have this API that we call the data store, which is essentially a database behind the DHS2 API. This is very helpful when you build uh, you know, web applications, if you build extensions, if you build integrations, scripts, uh, data processing tools, whatever. Um, you can now have this database that stores JSON documents within DHS2. So if you have this lightweight need for persistence, 
There's no need to install really a separate database just for that. You can use DHS2. And the benefit is that everything can be backed up with DHS2. So there's no need to maintain a separate database, or be backups, management, etc. It's just there. And in 239, uh, or 88, we actually made it a lot more powerful. So now we have um, support for all these things that we have in a normal metadata API for DHS2. So we have things like filtering of fields. If you have used the metadata API, um, you're familiar with these things. You can filter which of the properties of the fields you can get back. You can filter uh, which objects to return. We can have paging now. So you can, you can have a lot of objects in the namespace. You can do paging on those. And we can also do sorting. So if you want to sort um, different objects in a namespace based on a specific property, you can also do that now. So it's very sort of powerful and then um, you know, more flexible. So we do recommend that you try to use these now for your, for your lightweight application persistence needs instead of creating a separate system on the outside, essentially. So this makes these to be much more of a kind of um, complex storage uh, system for, for, for arbitrary data. It's all in the documentation, so have a look there. And uh, you, know, you can tell your developers back home that to have a look, tell them that now it's, it's a lot more powerful. Okay. <laughs> Another one that we made, in, uh, made available in 239 is what we call the aggregate data exchange service. So uh, you know that there's a lot of talk about integrability these days, data integration, data exchange. Um, we also know that one of the top requests for data exchange and interoperability would be actually moving data from one data to to the other. <laughs> that is very often the, the use case. So, so we know that there's been built probably like a billion scripts that, that move data from, from one data to to the other. And if you go to a country, there will be one or more um, tools or custom solutions that do exactly this, like pull data out, do some lightweight processing or transformation, and then push it in to another system, uh, another data to instance. So we now have this integrated into this system. We call it the aggregate data exchange. This is a service that allows you to move data either from one data to to other instances of the HS2 um, or within a single instance. So you can actually also move data from tracker, for instance, to, to aggregate data. Um, so we talk about like moving data from what we call a source instance to a target instance. So the source is, of course, where the data lives, and the target is where you want to move the data to, obviously. So in this solution, um, we have data being aggregated in the source instance using the analytics instance. So they're using the analytics API internally to do aggregation. So that means you can use like data elements and indicators, program indicators, and everything else that you can use in analytics. Um, and then the system will automatically transform that into what we call the regular routine data values. And then you can move it to the third party instance of the HS2 or in the same instance and save it in the same thing. Um, and of course, this is quite powerful because now you can do aggregation, uh, for instance, from facility to district. You can summarize certain data elements. You can do calculations as part of indicators. You can also do uh, calculations on individual data based on program indicators and then save it as raw data or routine data in the same instance or in another instance of the HS2. So this will essentially hopefully replace a lot of scripts out there. <laughs> we don't have to go and build new scripts for this uh, once more. This can be run um, either ad hoc. So that means you can run it in the API or through an app. Um, we also have a scheduled job. So if you need to run data you know, every night or every you know, hour or whatever, you can set this up as a scheduled job as well to run automatically. So there's no need to have a cron job on the server that this can be handled uh, automatically by, by business. Okay, so what are the use cases? I'm sure you have a lot of use cases in your minds by now, but what are the use cases? We have, for instance, um, moving data from a dishes to HMIS instance over to a data portal instance. Many countries now have like a, like a data warehouse instance or a public data instance where they store data that's supposed to either be made publicly available or integrating multiple dishes to installations. You know that you have more and more instances now. Um, another use case would be moving data from a tracker instance. So you have your typical like tracker installation uh, over there. We have a lot of info, uh, confidential data. And then we have the HMS instance where you just want to have the summary, like the aggregation of those individual data. So one example is of course like HIV, where we might have an HIV registry on your tracker. And then you might have the typical like monthly HIV reporting form. 
very, you know, count the number of, you know, tests and people on treatment and people on care and so on. Um, and now we can move data using this solution automatically from the tracker to the aggregators. Another use case would be like pre-computation of our communicators. So um, you might want to pre-compute individual data, both for reporting purposes, but also for uh, performance reasons, right? Because we know that program indicators can be heavy to compute in real time. Uh, and so instead of computing those over and over and over, it might be a good idea to pre-compute into routine data and then move that into uh, either the same or another instance. Um, and finally, we're actually also working with the Global Fund on our project they call Direct Reporting. This is mostly in Africa so far. It might, I think it might come to Asia also, but so far in, in Africa, where we actually then uh, report the Global Fund automatically using the routine data in the HMS. So instead of taking data out of the system and using Excel, we can now infer the reporting from the national HMS and then produce the numbers the Global Fund wants actually. Okay. So we also have a web application. You can run it as a scheduled job, but there's also a web application. And I'm gonna show it to you super quick. Let me just get this stuff here to work. Uh, okay, so. So there is a web app in the App Store that we call uh, Data Exchange. So you can go to Data Exchange. Um, these things have to be configured in, in the API using Postman for now. Uh, it's well documented, so you probably want to talk to your uh, your developer or some, some someone who knows how to use API. And then we can once you created the Data Exchange, just go to the source of the target. You can go here and say, I want to pick this Data Exchange. Um, that gives us a summary of what you're trying to submit. So if you're moving data to, to a global donor, if you're moving data to another instance of HS2, they can also have this kind of manual uh, approval of data or reviewing of data before we submit it to the other instance. Um, so I can look at this and then uh, I can click, I can review the data and I can click submit the data and say yes, submit. Um, and this is helpful because now people can do this kind of manual review and understand what they're actually submitting to the other you know, uh, instance they're reporting to essentially. Okay. This, this app is found in the App Store um, and you can grab it there and install it into your instance. Okay, that was it. So shifting gears a little bit. So we have now, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit more about geometry now and the way we handle geometries and polygons and geospatial data in DHS2. We have a lot of different improvements um, in the later versions, and they actually also belong together. So we're gonna to talk about a couple of features, and then I'm gonna to try to bring it together in the end to explain how we can use this. So in uh, 238, we had a new solution for what we call um, metadata attributes of type GeoJSON. GeoJSON is now the industry standard format for geospatial data. It's a lightweight JSON-based format that is very easy to use and very popular to use for geospatial data, like polygons and points and features and so on. Um, so we have this as a value type now for attributes. So what this means is that we can now have any number of geometries for units. You can create multiple metadata attributes and then um, give it the JSON, GeoJSON value type. And through that, we can now store multiple geometries for an organ. What that means is that we can not only have one uh, polygon, for instance, per district, but we can have multiple. And the same for facilities. So we can have like geographic uh, boundaries, we can have administrative boundaries. For the facilities, this means that we can have the points of the uh, facility, but we can also have the catchment area of the facility stored for the organics. This is very helpful if you want to do a bit more advanced analysis in, in GIS. So this can, of course, uh, be displayed in maps as you're going to have a look in a, in a minute. Um, we're also collaborating with a company called uh, Crosscut, which is interesting. These guys work on essentially uh, automatically creating catchment areas for facilities. They also do more things, but that, that's one of the main um, things that their service can do. And we know that a lot of countries struggle with having reliable catchment area population for their facilities. It's not easy to, to generate, right? Because it's always dubious to understand which people go to which facilities. So, and we have seen numerous different approaches to this problem over the years. Um, South Africa has had their approach. 
uh, by essentially using certain data elements and distributed according to the district population and so on. Uh, this is a new approach to this, where you can actually use those servers to automatically create boundaries to every sort of facility to indicate the catchment area. So there is a, an app now in the App Store that's kind of an app on top of their service that allows you to upload uh, your facility coordinates. In fact, you will get uh, automatically generated boundaries for catchment areas. And this is based on many different factors like travel time, road accessibility, quality of the roads, uh, rivers, mountains, terrain, uh, and so on. They're using what they call remote sensing uh, and geospatial data, satellite imagery, to calculate these things. You might want to give it a try uh, and see if it's realistic, but, but this can be interesting. So um, then you can use this service, then essentially get the boundaries and then store it back into this or two using this mentioned secondary attributes for, 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 uh, for uh, Organs. Okay. Um, we also added support for GeoJSON for organic geometry import. So now uh, you can take GeoJSON files and then you can import it straight into these just two organs. Uh, and this is good. Previously, we had this GML format, uh, and that one, as probably all of you know, that is very clunky, hard to work with, not very well supported out there in the community, um, kind of old school. GeoJSON is a new format that almost every provider supports. So we have ArcGIS, QGIS, you know, Mapbox, Carco, Tableau, these things, they all support GeoJSON, that's the main part. So we have also now uh, started to support this. So this really simplifies like integration, it simplifies working with other tools. We do also support export of the data in DHS2 to GeoJSON, so they can actually take data from DHS2 and move it into ArcGIS or QGIS by doing an export. Yeah. So this makes setting up maps easier, it simplifies API integrations, it really simplifies working with existing uh, geospatial tools out there, both in terms of importing data and, and, and exporting data. You can find this in the import export application. Yeah. Okay. The, um, the next sort of geo solution that we're going to talk about is Google Earth Engine Population Data Import. This is a really cool service that we now have integrated into the chest. So some of you might know that Google Earth Engine is this vast catalog of geospatial data that is managed, of course, by, by Google. And uh, they have built this kind of very computationally powerful uh, uh, service that allows you to do multiple types of calculations on this data. They also are integrating data from many, many different sources. They have satellites that they run themselves. They collaborate with uh, NASA, and they also collaborate with Rollpop, which is a project from the University of Southampton which is this kind of amazing database of population data that's globally uh, co covering pretty much the entire world. Um, so the world pop data set actually allows you to compute and look at population data down to a few square meters. So you can actually then automatically infer the population of different types of, of, of boundaries. So we now have integrated a way to automatically calculate population actually, for, for uh, organisms and DCS2, based on the boundaries that you have inside the system. So what you can do now is that if you have polygons for your districts, say, or your catchment areas, you can now actually automatically update, upload these organisms with their boundaries to the Earth Engine service. In fact, you will get population data, fairly accurate population data, based on... Oh. <laughs> Based on um, based on the boundaries that you that you upload to Earth, so uh, this is a way to automatically calculate data. This might be a replacement if you don't have reliable census data. You might be able to use this to get population data back. You might want to have it to double check to see if it's you know reliable, realistic for your country. But it could be a very good alternative, especially if you go further down in the hierarchy, things like catchment areas and so on. You can give it a try. So once you have done this upload, you can then save this data automatically for a particular data element in, in this chest. Okay, so let's, let's have a look at this and see how it works. So you can now go to the uh, import export application. And there's now something called Earth Engine Imports. So we go here, so we can say population, uh, we can say period. This is being fetched over the internet, so it might take a second. Um, so you can see we have census or data from for different years here. We can pick 2020. 
Uh, we can say round to zero decimals. We don't really want decimals for population. We can say, let's use the district level. And um, we can then say, which ailment do we want to import? So in this case, I've been, I've been um, setting up a special data element called total population earth engine. So this means that we can, in these two, you can actually have multiple data elements, multiple sets of population data uh, for the same instance. So you can have like census-based information, um, census-based information, you can have earth engine-based population data, and then you can actually have multiple sets of indicators to have both, right? And then you can use whatever you want to, to look at your analysis. And some people might have opinions, this is not reliable, this is not good, but you can have both and then you can make them happen. So we can say, we can say preview before import. This might take a second or two. What's happening now is that you, sorry. No. Sorry. What's happening now is that we actually uploaded the polygons to the Earth engine. What you see here now is essentially um, dynamically calculated population data for these districts. So this is automatically calculated based on row pop uh, and the boundaries of your facility or of your districts. And then they can essentially import now into the chest automatically without you having to do any kind of census and so on. So check it out. This I think this can be here useful. So check it out. Uh, you can also ask us if you have any questions or, 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 or wondering how to use it. Yeah. Okay, so summarizing all these things. So we have now uh, multiple organ geometries that you can set up with, with attributes. We have this thing I talked about for the crosscut service um, where we can then automatically generate the catchment area boundaries. Um, we have the GeoJSON uh, organ imports. We have Google Earth Engine for dynamically calculating the population data. And then once you have all this in the system, now we can start to use, of course, create indicators, visualizations, maps, and all these things based on the, on the data that we just imported. So, so you can put this nicely together to produce these uh, new, new ways of doing analysis, new ways of generating uh, catchment areas, population data, and so on. Yeah. And then, of course, you can produce nice maps like this. This maps actually shows you now um, uh, boundaries that's automatically created. It shows you population data that's also dynamically created from Earth Engine. And the map layer you see there is the Earth Engine population layer that you can also visually place on top of your maps or use as base maps in your, in, your, in, your, uh, in your maps visualizations. And all this stuff is dynamically calculated. Nothing you need to do in terms of collecting data. Okay, so that was it. Let's shift gears a bit again. So we also have, um, <laughs> we also have uh, what we call personal access tokens. We're shifting gears a bit now talking about security. So in 238, we also add support for what we call personal access tokens. This was a major gap in DHS2. Uh, we know that people have been mostly using what we call basic authentication up to now. So basic authentication isn't very secure. It means that you have to expose the username and the password, and we don't really recommend using that for integration. So in 238, we have something called personal access tokens. Some people call this API tokens. They're pretty much the same thing. So this allows you now to set up uh, existing tools, third-party systems, build integrations and so on. And then instead of using a username and a password, you can now use an access token, which is more suitable for machine-to-machine -machine communication and integration. So again, this can be used for integration services. If you have a public web portal where you would like to pull data from DHS2, we do recommend that you use uh, an API token instead of a username and a password because uh, it, it, we do think it's a lot more secure. Um, the benefit would be that it has an expiration date, so you can set it to expire after a certain amount of time, which means if it's compromised, at least uh, the attacker will eventually be locked out. Um, you can restrict it to specific IPs, so that means if you have a public web portal that runs on your government, let's say, website, um, then you can limit access to just that particular instance, that IP or, or domain. So that improves security because now people cannot use this to spam your server or, or attack your server. Um, it can also be revoked, so you can easily take it off without remove it, without deleting the user. You can just revoke the API token instead of having to delete the entire user account behind it. Um, and it also gives you access only to the API. With the access token, you cannot log in and look at the data as you can with basic. So uh, there's no access to the UI, you can only access the API. 
So super quick, you can create this by going to um, settings. Uh, you can click personal access token. You can say generate new token server. You can choose between server and script or browser context. This is like if you're building an integration. This is if you're building a web application. You can say how many days it should take before it expires. You can say the allowed IP addresses. Uh, you can say allowed HTTP methods, meaning get and post and put and so on. And then you can say generate new token. And here's your token that you can use. So once again, like we do recommend that when you build, um, you know, a, Web portals, if you build integrations, you should use this API token instead of the typical username, password, and basic authentication. Okay. Okay. This is just informational. Um, shifting gears. I'm shifting gears a lot there, so I uh, hope you can, can follow. Uh, <laughs> so, in terms of integration, um, we also have a native Rapid Pro integration now that we have that the integration team led by my Morton and Bob have built. We're going to talk a lot more about this later today or tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. So I'm not going to go uh, in detail. Just want to mention that we have built now a kind of native integration with Rapid Pro that allows you so far to um, synch synchronize the contacts of Rapid Pro. Rapid Pro is essentially a system that allows you to surveys, uh, collect data using things like SMS, WhatsApp, all types of mobile uh, systems and protocols and also build workflows around it. So you can have communication going on over SMS or WhatsApp. Um, so we can now synchronize contacts. We can transfer uh, aggregate reports from uh, Rapid Pro to, S to DHS2. And we can also send reminders uh, to Rapid Pro users in terms of sending their reports to DHS2. Uh, so more about this tomorrow, but now you can check it out. If you're running Rapid Pro in your country, you can check it out and, and see if it's interesting to you. All right, so let's move over to analytics. So we're moving over to the analytics section. Um, and the major news for analytics um, is essentially a new line listing application. So we have a new uh, line listing app that replaces part of what we, of, of the previous event reports app. So before this, we have the event reports where you can do these line lists. Now we have a dedicated app for just for line lists. And it's quite quite nice. So let's, let's have a look. Um, first of all, it has, uh, much more user-friendly dimension selection. So we can now do this kind of uh, easy selection of, of items within every dimension. We have drag and drop layout design like we have in the data visualizer application. We have improved handling of repeatable events, meaning uh, repeatable stages in the program. We couldn't really handle that before, but now we have a way to deal with what we call repeatable stages and repeatable events. Um, we also have multiple time dimensions supported so that you can have uh, more than just uh, reporting dates in the report, but also have uh, a lot of different time dimensions in the, in the line list. And we also support legend uh, based coloring now for, for line lists to put to do what you guys often call scorecards, where you can have different colors to mean different things for, for numbers or, or values in the report. So let's have a look. Um, this is the new layout. So as you can see, we have on the left, there's what we call the dimensions panel, where we have uh, the type of inputs. We have what we call program dimensions, which is essentially the elements, indicators, and so on. Um, your dimensions that are typically group sets, organet group sets, et cetera. Um, and then comes main dimensions, organet, event status, created by. And then we have, as you can see, multiple time dimensions, depending on the program, uh, what's, what's being configured for the program. Uh, and then the secondary panel there, we have uh, different types of selection. In this case, you can select the elements, indicators, and so on for the program. Um, on the top, you can see the columns and the filters, which are quite similar to the data visualizer app. So very similar to the pivot table and, and charts that you've seen. And of course, then the, the line list itself there in the middle. So, so um, we also have much better way of selecting items. So if you have very long, Code lists like ICD 10 or ICD 11 or SNOMED, or whatever, uh, it's now easy to, to make selections within these types of, of code lists. So let's let's jump to it and have a look. So the app is called Line Listing. So we go to uh, to Line Listing. This is also in the App Hub. Um, so you need to go to the App Hub and install it. Actually, there's also no need to go to the App Hub. You can go to the App Management application, and we have integrated installation for um, app, apps in the app up there. 
So, so let's have a look. So first of all, we can say, I would like to look at events or enrollments. So events, obviously it could be uh, event only program or one stage in the program, uh, tracker program. Enrollments will then focus on enrollments within a tracker program. So next step, we can select the program. Uh, in this case, let's select uh, inpatient morbidity mortality, which is an inpatient program. Um, okay, then I can say, I would like to look at just the data elements. And then I can say, uh, okay, I would like to add this to my report. I can say add to columns. I can also click here to add a filter. So I can add a condition if I like to do that, for instance, on years. I'm just gonna add it now. Um, same for diagnosis. I can also drag and drop. I can drag it up here. Discharge date, gender. Uh, I can also make a particular selection. So I can say, I just wanna look at females or males and just click on that and say, either add to columns or add to filter. So of course, adding to filter means it will filter the table, adding to columns means it will be part of the table uh, with, the, with the particular uh, potential filter. I can say height, uh, mode of discharge. I can click to make a selection. So I can say, I would like to look at discharge and, and transferred and wait. <clears throat> and I click, I have to select the time dimension. So I say, I would like to include my report date and I would like to look at my last 12 months, for instance. I can choose between relative and, and fixed periods. So we can do particular months or quarters. Uh, we can also say last 12 months, last four quarters, and so on and so on, like you can do in the, in the visualizer. Last 12 months. And then I can hide this one. And then I have a nice table like this where we can, we can look at the different events uh, in this program. So we can add filters, we can change and remove columns, add and remove columns, uh, we can play with it like this. We can say, let me move this one up to the filter instead and select this. And now that, that particular data element is now moved out of the table and up to the filter like this. So you can drag and drop, uh, it should be easy to use. Same kind of visual layout that we have in the data visualizer. So we hope to also reuse some of the training, some of the kind of memory muscle, as we like to call it, <laughs> from, the, from the data visualizer. So it, should be, so it shouldn't be too hard to use. Okay. okay, we also have what we call repeatable stage or repeatable event handling. So in the previous system, you couldn't really uh, visualize like multiple events if you had repeat, repeatable stages in a program. Uh, but now we found a way to, to deal with this. So let me show you how it works. I'm gonna start over. So let's start by having a look at what we call enrollment uh, analysis. Um, then we can say, I would like to go to my RMNCH tracker program. And here I can then go and say, uh, let me look for hemoglobin, for instance. I know that my second antenatal care visit uh, stage is a repeatable stage. I'm gonna click on this one. And now we have this little cool thing called repeated events up here. I can say repeated events. I would like to look at the last three most recent events and how many oldest events you would like to have. So if you have many um, second visits, in a, let's say an antenatal care program, we can now go and say, I would like to look at the last three events for this repeatable stage. And once again, I need to select the time dimension, that's important. And then you click update. And now we can see that we have a hemoglobin value, most recent minus two, most recent minus one and most recent. So we can look at the last three um, events values for hemoglobin in the antenatal care program like this. So quite nice way of visualizing multiple uh, visits when, when we have repeatable stages like this. Yeah. Okay, cool. So last point on the line listing app is uh, multiple time dimensions. So we also have, if we go and select the program, let's go back to the RMNCH, or we can do the, um, let's see here. Uh, yeah, we can do the RMNCH. As you can see here now, we have multiple time dimensions, event dates, there's data for visit, scheduled dates, last updated on. So we can, we can basically drag uh, whatever time dimension we would like to see up here. So this is quite helpful. Instead of just having the reporting dates, we can now have all of these different types of dimensions. 
This also depends a little bit on how you configure your program. Um, this also reflects the labels that you put on each of these things. As you know, some of these dates labels can be customized in the program, and th that will be reflected here in the in the application. So whatever you call uh, reporting dates or due date or schedule date and so on will be reflected under the time dimensions as well. So, so this is quite helpful to make uh, better use of the time in, in your in your reports. Yeah. And finally, we have also legend coloring of text and cells. Uh, we also have favorites, of course, so we can go here and look at different types of, of favorites. I've been cheating a bit and creating a favorite for this. So now we can see that you can also have legend coloring of the different values in your line list. So we know that you guys like to make scorecards. You, you like to kind of highlight values which indicate that something is bad or, or too low or, or wrong. Um, so we can now have things like, you know, particular color for, for bad data and, you know, nice colors for good data. I don't know if red is good or bad in some of, these, in some of your countries, but in, in many countries, red is, is bad and green, green is good. We go to options. And there's something called legend. So we can say, I would like to use a predefined legend or choose a single legend. Up here, we can define the, the legend style. Then you can change the background color or the text color. And then we can say updates. And that will nicely put colors <laughs> that's right, uh, in, the, in the line list like this, depending on your legend set. This can, of course, be configured in the maintenance app, where you can set whatever legend set you would like to use for, for this thing. Yeah. Okay, so shifting gears again, we're going now to GIS again. Uh, we have some more innovation in the, in the geospatial uh, dimension. So in the maps application, we also added a new layer from Earth Engine that we call the building and structure layer. So this layer is built on, built on a, a data set called the Open Building Dataset, which is hosted by, by Google. It contains half a billion buildings in, across the world. You might have to check coverage in your country, but it, it, it's really impressive and there's a lot of countries. It's maybe mostly in, in Africa, but I think there's also decent coverage in, in Asia. So in Africa, it covers actually 64% of the entire continent. So let's have a look. Might take a second to load. We go to maps and then we go to add layer. And as you can see, if you have configured Google Earth Engine for your DHS2 installation, then we can go and click on one of the layers called building footprints. So we can actually zoom in a little bit first. That's as much to make it load a bit faster. We can also use the satellite imagery as the, as the background layer. We can say add layer building footprints. And all you have to do is to click add layer. And this one might actually take a second. <laughs> To load, let's see how fast the internet is now. <laughs> um, it will come, just give it a second. <laughs> so here we can see it's starting to, to populate. Um, so once again, this is based on something called Grid3 uh, and the Google building data set that have mapped out a lot of the buildings in many countries using remote sensing. So based on the satellite imagery, they can now point out the buildings in, in many countries. And this can be quite helpful if you're doing things like malaria spraying campaigns, if you have a teams that have to go out to communities and spray houses, um, or if you have to have community health workers that have to go house by house you know, and provide child health services or you know, maternal health services, whatever it is. This can be quite nice because now they can actually see where the buildings are, where they need to go. We also plan to be able to allow for importing this data set into DHS2 as tracker data so that each building can become a track entity. Um, and that way, we, we can also, of course, add the coordinates to the buildings. And hopefully, in the future, then we can allow for optimizing um, travel distance and like path for, for community health workers to travel and so on, and allow them to easily find buildings to understand where people live uh, and create combined with working lists and tracker and so on and so on. So this can be this can be quite useful. We think so far it's only a visual layer in the in maps, but we do plan to to integrate this further into the application essentially. Yeah. So once again, just add, go to add layers and set this up. We have several guides on the docs.dhs2.org for how to configure Earth Engine for DHS2. You, you you have to go through a few steps, but it's not not very complicated. So uh, it should be well described in the in the documentation. 
Okay. Yeah. We also have improved interpretations in maps. So the interpretations panel is now new and we're using the same interpretations panel as we do in, in the data visualizer application. So we can now write nice interpretations also there. All right, let's shift gears to the tracker. Let's just see how we are in time. Um, let's shift gears to tracker. So for tracker, we also have a lot of improvements. Um, over the last few years, we spent a lot of energy now on performance in tracking, right? So as we talked about many times, um, this thing called COVID-19 happened, uh, which meant that we're not only ingesting like children or a particular cohort of people with a particular disease into Tracker. Now, many of you had to import your entire population into Tracker. So that meant a lot for, for DHS2 because now we had to kind of really push the boundaries in terms of performance. So we spent a lot of time just making the thing faster, right? Working on different types of performance improvements, optimizations, finding bottlenecks, removing them and so on. Um, and I think it actually helped, like we made some, a lot of improvements, even though many countries still struggle, a lot of countries actually managed pretty well during the pandemic. Uh, and we managed to improve the performance quite a lot for Tracker. So this is a chart from a monitoring tool uh, for a particular un unmentioned uh, country where we uh, managed to have um, up to 25,000 requests per minute for Tracker. We had 3,000 people being searched for, for every minute. We had 230 people registered in the system every minute, and we had more than 4,000 values being uh, stored every every minute in that system for Tracker. So we really managed to improve performance. There's more to be done, especially on analytics, but we made some improvements, and, and many countries managed to get through the pandemic pretty well in terms of testing and, and so on. Uh, we also wrote a uh, guideline for performance in the docs.dsh2 portal. Uh, the thing is that DHS2 is very configurable, which means you can do a lot of good things and you can also do a lot of dumb things. Um, it's easy to kind of configure DHS2 in a way where the system is just becomes slow, no matter how much big server you have or how many gigahertz of, of processes you have, right? And a lot of this is about program indicators. So for instance, like you should not create very complicated program indicators that counts every age, um, you know, COVID-19, uh, positive case since 2018 and put it on put it on the first dashboard in the system. That is a bad idea, right? Um, also, you shouldn't have, you know, two gigabytes of memory if you're running a national COVID-19 uh, system. So like, there's many things that you as implementers also should think about when it comes to performance. It's not like the system will perform well, no matter how you, how you set it up. Uh, it really relates to how you configure it also. So you have to be smart in terms of making the system performant. And we wrote a guide that explains a lot of this. So, so if you're running a high performance, and this is beyond COVID-19, it also relates to other things. So um, if you're running a high volume tracker instance, for instance, uh, we recommend that you have a look at this uh, guideline and, and read through it and see if there's something you can optimize. There's always a lot of things you can do in your instance, like for instance, pre-computing some of this, uh, program indicator um, values. So in, instead of kind of recalculating every time someone opens a dashboard and so on and so on. So have a look at this. It's all in the docs.dhs2 org implementation section. Okay. Um, we also make, uh, made a lot of improvements in terms of the tracker um, web application. So first of all, we managed now to mo move most, if not everything, but most of the features from the old tracker capture application over to the new Capture web application. And the new one uh, is built on the new technology stack based on React instead of Angular. Uh, it looks much better. It looks much cleaner and nicer. Um, so, and this is of course the app we're gonna focus on moving forward. So we hope that you guys can slowly migrate over to the new application. Still a couple of things around relationships and, and uh, referrals and so on that lack, but we're getting there and almost there now. So in terms of the new capture application, we added things like search for individuals. It's easy now to search. You can select the program. You can now search. You can just choose to search uh, for by unique ID, or you can search for different other attributes like, like first name, last name, date of birth. So we improved the search experience. We also made a much nicer tracker enrollment dashboard. So this is like the patient to the person dashboard where we have uh, you know, enrollment information, there are stages, events, you can see all the stages and all the events now in the same screen without having this kind of clunky uh, bar on the top that you have to navigate. There's comment indicators, a profile and so on. Uh, we have a person and enrollment widget, so we can go and, and 
perform different actions around enrollments, as you're going to see. So let's have a quick look. So you go to the capture application, and we can go to child health, for instance. And the first time you do this, you might have to opt in. This is a little function for like opting into using the new tracker UI. If not, you will be redirect to the old application. So here we can go, there's no search here, so we can just scroll down and we can click on one of the children. And here we can see the new dashboard. So it looks much better now, uh, new look and feel. It looks more, much more modern and nice. Um, and as you can see, we have quick actions on the top. There's different stages uh, coming here with all the events in the same screen. So there's no need to do this kind of horizontal bar anymore. Um, and we can see the different stages, birth, postnatal in this case. And then you can click on the different events to look at the data. Uh, you can click on the data on the events for multiple stages. There's the uh, comments up here, so we can put in comments, indicators showing you different you know, calculations or indicator data for this particular enrollment. There's also the person profile, so we can go here and, and look at the different uh, information for this person. And down here, we have the enrollment widget. So we can do, we can complete the enrollment, we can mark it for follow-up, we can cancel the enrollment, and we can delete the entire enrollment. So we can manage the enrollment down here. We also see different information like date of enrollment, date of birth, when it started, who is the, considered the owning organet for this enrollment, so like to call it, and then when, when was it last updated. Um, we also have a view event mode. So we now have a dedicated screen for viewing the information for the events. So instead of having to go straight to the edit screen, we can now just look at the data, which is nicer in terms of viewing the data and also like preventing accidental changes of the data. So we can say, we can click here, and now we get this read only screen where we can look at the data for this particular event. We can go to edit event to, to change it so that we have, you know, different fields here, app card score and comment and weight and, and all these things. Um, we can complete the event if you want, and then we can click, click save down here. We also now have a dedicated screen for scheduling events. So in the old capture application, like scheduling was this kind of, was this kind of clunky uh, operation where you just have to set the date in, in, in the future. So setting an event date in the future implicitly meant we now are scheduling a meeting in the future for a checkup or a follow-up or whatever. Now we have this dedicated tab that says schedule, which makes it clear to the to the data entry person or the you know clinical care provider to actually schedule something in the future. So we can go to schedule, we can set the schedule date, and we have an explanation down there that explains what that actually means. So this should hopefully simplify the experience for scheduling uh, new checkups in, in the future. Okay. A key, a key concept now inside Tracker is what we call the working lists. So working lists is becoming kind of a main, main uh, tool for, for health providers uh, to follow up with patients and, and people. So we think of the working list as a work process tool. We can do things like task lists, schedule events, like you can have community health workers decide like which people to follow up on in the, in the coming week. It can be clinical care providers saying which Pregnant women are supposed to come in this week. Uh, which pregnant women am I supposed to give attention to this week, and so on and so on. So this is, if you want to enforce some kind of process around follow-ups, etc., or, or, or tasks being done, um, the working list can be a suitable uh, tool for you. So we improve the whole user experience around work, uh, working lists. We also have things like filter for user assigned to event. In later versions, we can actually assign an event to a person. So that means if you would like to allocate a particular person, a particular household, a particular uh, follow-up in the future to, a, to some person or some user in the system, we can now do that uh, in, in the capture app itself. And then in the, in the working list, that means we can now filter by that. So a person can say, okay, show me only uh, you know, tasks or items that are assigned to me. Right? So I can have my own personal to-do list more or less within, uh, within the HST. We also have filters. We can configure which columns to look at, as you're going to see, um, and also the order of events. We can come to configure that straight in the working working list. And we also added the ability to save the working list and also share it with others. So it looks like this. Uh, as you can see here, we have a, a list with different filters on top, and we can have the assigned to filter and so on. And then we can use the assigned filter to say, okay, I just want to look at my 
um, my events, et cetera, et cetera. So let's see if we can do a demo of this. So we can select a, a program, organ it. I can say create custom working lists. I only have three events, but you can see here that we have um, enrollment status. We can do filters to say only active enrollments, for instance. Um, we can do date of enrollment. We can say today, this week, this month, this year, um, or do custom ranges like start, start and end dates. <laughs> we can also put uh, filters on arbitrary like date elements. We can do, uh, again, like assigned only events that are assigned to me, assigned to anyone, none, or, or a particular user like this. And you can also add arbitrary filters like this. So we can say, you know, date of birth, and then you can uh, put a filter on the date of birth as well. Um, down over here, we can also configure the columns. So you can say, okay, I would like to include the weight and the height. And then we get those columns here straight in the list. So you can customize the lists according to your needs, whatever information you would like to see in this particular list. And once you're done with all that, we can then go and save. So you can save current view, and then we can say, you know, uh, in this case, we can say woman, woman to see or we'll follow up with. Uh, we can save it as a filter, and then we can quickly come back to those filters and switch between multiple filters, of course. Uh, and finally, we can also share. So we can say share view. So this is like the typical normal sharing uh, concept in DHS2. So if you want to share this with uh, a group of users, you can create these kind of working lists and you can give it, assign it to like all your health providers in a particular facility or a district. Uh, we can easily share this now also with other users in the system, just like we can share data elements and, and whatnot in DHS2. Yeah. So I think that the, the tracker team is spending a lot of energy around this around providing this kind of a work, work uh, process flow, uh, workflow to, to, to different uses of this system. Okay, and finally, we have this new cool thing that we call uh, continuously released applications. I don't know how many of you have actually, uh, you know, understood this or, or, or kind of been digging into this, but uh, over the last year or so, we have started to what they call continuously release some web applications. And what that means is that you can now actually get updates to some of the web apps without having to upgrade the entire DHS2. So up to now, like you would, every time there's a fix, you would actually have to download the, you know, the war file that's, you know, I don't know how many hundred megabytes it is now these days, but it's, it's quite large. Um, it also means that you have to do a reboot, you know, update your server, restart everything. Uh, you probably have to test everything. Um, you don't want regressions, so you have to test existing features and so on. It's kind of an involved operation. So what you're doing now to kind of speed up development, speed up what they call like time to market or uh, the time for you guys to actually receive bug fixes and, and small features and improvements, you're now doing what we call continuous release. So this means that you can go to the app management app and look for updates to apps. So if there's just one bug fix, if there's just one small feature that you want, uh, in an app that's continuously released, then you can actually go and update just that app. And even without restarting your server, you can just do this on a running uh, instance of DHS2. So this is quite convenient because now you don't have to test everything. There's no need to go back and test the other 39 apps just because, just because you want uh, one update to one application, right? Uh, and the, the, the capture application is now on this continuously released um, paradigm. So, that means you can actually look for updates directly in this. We also do this for the data visualizer, the dashboard, and, and some other applications there. All right, um, moving on. So Android, oh, <laughs> we also have a, a segment on Android. So um, the Android application now is actually, as some of you talked about yesterday, becoming a really powerful application and also quite a stable application. I think as Hanan explained uh, very well yesterday, uh, it's no longer uh, kind of a beta thing. It's really a production ready and well tested uh, application. It still has some issues, right? I mean, if you, if you try to throw 100,000 users at it, there will be some works here and there, but it's, it's quite stable now. And it's been used in numerous implementations. I think Bangladesh is the biggest one. And then there's Nigeria, uh, and I think India also uh, are using it to large scale. And I think more than 20 countries, about 20 countries are now using this as a fairly large scale now. Um, and we have you know, hundreds of thousands of people actually using this locally. So, so this is now a, a tested thing that you should seriously adopt, uh, seriously consider if you're thinking about doing outreach data capture and analysis. 
And we have a big team now um, working on, 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 um, on Android. I think there's like 15 people now or so working on, on, the, cap on the Android application. So it's something that we really prioritize and, and put um, you know, manpower behind. So um, for the last two versions, they called it 2.5 and 2.6. They're now working on 2.7. Um, we made a lot of improvements, in particular around analytics. So they did actually now implement a completely new analytics engine that runs locally on the device. So there's a new way now of doing uh, analytics that does not depend on the internet, that does not use the online version for analytics, but it actually renders the analytics locally on the device. Uh, both the calculation of the data as well as rendering the different types of visualizations. So the cool thing is that you can actually go out in the field, you can capture data on the device while being offline, and then you can also do what we call real-time analytics directly on the device, on the data that you just captured without connecting to the internet. So that means you can go out you know, in, the, in the field to the communities or on campaigns or whatever, collect data and actually provide feedback to people or look at data uh, all while being offline. So as you can see here, we have these very nice and, and, and good looking visualizations. We support not everything, but we support a fair amount of the features that we support on the web um, is now also supported on Android. So a lot of the visualizations like pi and line and, and the single values and, and radar charts, and these things can now be rendered on the, on the Android device as well. This is quite cool, so you should check it out. Um, we also added a new thing that we call groups. This is pretty much like dashboards. It's almost like a dashboard. We call it something else, not to confuse it. So uh, we call it like analytics groups, which are essentially collections of visualizations. So that means we can now combine things like paper tables, um, charts, visualizations, different types of line charts and, and bar charts and so on in a single page, pretty much like a dashboard. Um, this you can configure in what we call the Android settings app. So once again, in the app hub, there's an app called the Android settings application. Um, so you can go there, uh, configure it, and then you can set up exactly which visualizations you would like to make available for Android so that they don't get like a billion visualizations and get overloaded and confused. But you can tailor exactly which visualizations should be available. Um, and you can also then configure these groups so that you can, people can select from different groups of visualizations. Again, some of the things you create on the web is not compatible with Android, but with the Android settings app, you do filter out the ones that are not compatible with Android. So you can only see the ones that we actually support on Android, which is, again, most of the types of visualizations. Um, so if you're familiar with the Android application, um, you would like to know that this can be displayed on what we call the home screen of the app. It can be displayed uh, next to a data set and also next to a program within the application. Yeah, so uh, once again, I just want to show you some screenshots because this one is so beautiful now, so it's nice to, <laughs> it's nice to look at. So uh, within the visualizations, we also have some interactivity. So you can also go and say, uh, I would like to filter by period. I would like to filter by organic, like you can do in the, in the visualizer on the web, just a bit more limited, but you can still uh, filter by period, like the monthly, daily, and yearly. Uh, you can filter by organic. So all the organics that you have access to Within the application, you can then filter on within the, within the chart itself. Uh, you can also switch visualization types. You can go from you know, a line chart to a table to a value, single value, like you can do in a dashboard on the web, um, and then switch directly within the application. Yeah, we have column charts and renders nicely like this uh, in the middle of the screen like that. Uh, you can see the actual number indicators can also be displayed uh, below like that. Um, we also support legends. So if you have legends, put legends on, uh, let's say, a pivot table on the web, that legend will also render nicely on the, on the Android. And this is like a completely new rendering engine uh, on the web, on the mobile. Yeah, so we also support pivot, pivot tables like this. Uh, of course, like we don't recommend you to put a million columns if you want to display it on the mobile. We do recommend that you create smaller ones that are actually easy to use and, and, and watch on a, on a device with smaller screens. But if you create this kind of basic pivot tables, they render quite nicely on the, on the mobile app. Um, and of course, you can pivot around the different dimensions. You can combine it and have you know, both pivots and charts in the same page in, the, in a group on, on the device like this. Yeah, and once again, like this can be configured in the Android settings application. 
So by downloading that one, we can now say, okay, uh, these are the visualizations I would like to show. And these are, these are the groups. As you can see here, like immunization is a group. And then we have the different you know, visualizations and then we have A and C and so on. So all these things can, can easily be configured. There's also a ton of different settings here for like how much data to synchronize, um, which programs to enable, what to show on the home screen, et cetera, et cetera. So many things you can customize to basically optimize the experience on the mobile device. Yeah, this is how we create the home visualization. Okay. Okay, so switching gears a bit, we also have within the Maps app, uh, the Android application, we also now have integrated navigation within the app. Uh, so this means we can now get direction to location of a person or a household or, or whatever else. Um, but we haven't really built our own navigation, of course. Like we, <laughs> we do, of course, utilize whatever navigation system that you have on your phone. We do, uh, so in Android, there's something called a hint. So we can essentially utilize whatever uh, directions provider is on the phone. Typically, that would be like Google, of course, Google Maps using the directions API, but Microsoft and other providers also exist. So this means that we can now actually have directions directly on the phone uh, in terms of finding people or houses. So if you are a community health worker and you have, let's say, you know, 10 children or 10 households that you need to see that day, and you have entered the coordinates for all those households or people, then you can navigate directly to that person or household from within your phone, from within the Android application. It's quite cool. So once again, like if you have the location, the, the, the long lats of the person or the house, you just click on the house and the, the, the application will suggest the fastest routes to that person or thing straight within the application. That's quite cool. This is actually being used. I know that some, some organizations use this already, and they say it's quite helpful because now people can find their houses that they're supposed to, work, uh, to, to find more quickly without even leaving the application. So it saves time. Uh, we can also center the map to the current position and do you know, all the things you used to do in, in Google Maps and Bing Maps and this stuff. Yeah, and of course, this is very helpful if you're a community health worker, if you're a spray operator doing some kind of campaign and, and so on and so on. Because now the households can, of course, also be registered in these as too as a, as a track entity and have coordinates. So some other improvements that we made. So uh, previously a limitation was that you can only have one user per device. Um, and that people complained about that uh, mainly for two reasons. Like one, sometimes there's no funding to buy devices for everyone. You would like to reuse the device. Uh, and if not, what people did was just to create these kind of generic accounts. So they created um, accounts that they reused across people. We don't really recommend that. Uh, the main reason is that that doesn't make it possible to have audit logs. So if you're working with confidential data or patient data, we really recommend that you have one user account per individual that used the data because then we know, you know who did what essentially. If anything goes wrong, if there's a data breach or if there's some kind of you know, confidentiality problem, at least we know who did what in the system from the audit logs. If you're using, reusing accounts, uh, it's less secure because now you know the password is out there in the wild. You have to talk about the password. Um, if anything goes wrong, you can always blame someone else and so that. So, so try to use one user account per human being. Now, in the latest version for Android, we can actually have up to three different user accounts on the same device. So uh, internally, we actually have one database per user. So they are completely separated. So they have to download and sync data and collect data in their own database on the device. But there can now be three local user accounts per device, essentially. Uh, we also support switching between the accounts while being offline. So even if you're offline, we can still switch between the accounts. So if you're sitting in a facility or hospital, you can, without connectivity, you can also switch between those accounts if people come and go into different shifts. Yeah. So the first login must be offline, online, but then it can be offline. Uh, so again, this really enables um, um, having the same device used appropriately across multiple people in the same facility or, or hospital. Okay, we also built some cool things like QR code information sharing. Um, so we can now use QR codes to share data. So uh, we can essentially then, if you have tracking data on one device, uh, you can now render that as a QR code and another device can just take a photo of that QR code and then you can share information uh, directly between the devices without having connectivity even. So this is quite nice if you're not online and you need to kind of combine or share patient data 
between or whatever data between devices, let's say in the hospital, without being without being connected. Um, okay, we also support something called GS1 data matrix. I don't know how many people know about this one, but uh, the GS1 data matrix is kind of a standard within standard identification system in healthcare. So it's used for many different uh, use cases within within health. Uh, one very popular domain would be medical product, products and logistics. So if you look at medical products, they very often have this little barcode um, that is encoded using what's called a GS1 data matrix. And the GS1 data matrix is a standard way of encoding information for these types of products. And they typically contain things like the item number, like a global item number, uh, for instance, like a batch number, expiration dates, which country uh, product was produced and these type of things. So. So if, you, if you're working in logistics with BHS2, there's a good chance that you will come across this standard. Um, so if you use the Android device to quickly scan uh, the, the, those types of QR codes, let's say in a warehouse or in a facility, then you can use program rules to assign different pieces of information within that QR code to data elements in BHS2. So using the phone, you can then scan the data matrix QR code and then retrieve things like the item number, batch number, uh, expiration date, and so on, and put it straight into data elements in the tracker program, uh, just using your phone. So that's quite convenient if you're using this type of standard and you're working, for instance, with logistics uh, in, in this system. Okay. We also put in options at rendering. So um, if you have a single data element in a section in the program stage, uh, and you have icons for every option in the, in the option set, we can now render the different options just as icons. And this is quite helpful if you're working with people that have a low literacy level, people that are not very good readers, if it's just more convenient to associate a particular option with an icon or, a, or an image, people can now just click on the image instead of having to read the dropdown, for instance. So it, it makes life easier if you have simple form um, and perhaps low literacy among your user population, then this can be quite, quite helpful. We also improved the search in Android. So um, it's a new search field. And now we also do the search where we first search locally, and then we search uh, online. So that means before, like you had to search and have to wait many seconds to, to kind of combine the search with the online search. Now it first searches locally, returns the results immediately, and then does another fetch, another search online to look at the data that might sit on the server. So that makes the whole sort of user experience much more uh, snappy, much faster, much more interactive and, and easier to use. You can also now search across programs. There's no need to select the program first. We can just do a search and it will search for whatever individuals you have in your system without forcing you to select the program essentially. Right, I'm almost done now. I'm just gonna show you some beautiful screenshots uh, to wrap it up. <laughs> So we made some usability improvements also for Android. So there's uh, some, something like the next section button will always be visible. So it's very easy now to go to the next section all the time when you're doing data entry. Um, the new event button is also always visible now. So if you just want to quickly create many uh, events, for instance, if you're doing some kind of paper-based data entry, it's now easy to go next, next, next uh, and make that whole kind of batch entry experience faster. Uh, we made the, the larger tappable button areas. If you have you know big fingers like me, then it's easy now to hit the hit the button without having to be an expert and, and hitting that. And then when it comes to the data entry, we also have easy scrolling, it's easy to scroll down in large forms. Uh, the data entry field at the bottom there is also now always visible, so that you can you know there's no need to kind of have this have this kind of keyboard and field go up and down all the time. It's always it's always there. And that was it. <laughs> Um, yes, thanks for listening. I think we have, <laughs> we're at 10.30. I think we should do some questions. Do you have time for questions? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, this is a good time for questions. I don't know if this was, this was a lot of information, I know. Um, but if anyone has any question, no, no question is too dumb. Um, feel free to ask now. We can also talk over coffee, of course. Uh, but if you have any question, um, please, please uh, raise those. Online. Oh, we have one online question. Um, is there a limit to how many DHS instances uh, can I exchange data for the main device receiving instance? Oh, you mean for the data exchange? What well, the data exchange feature, probably? I believe so. <laughs> that is a very good question. So 
I believe the question was, when it comes to the aggregate data exchange solution, like how many instances can be used? So, so this one is um, quite flexible in that regard. So this one means that there's actually just, the, uh, the data exchange itself sits in the source instance. So you would actually create the data exchange itself on the source instance of the HS2. Uh, but there's no limits on how many target instances you can have. So you can actually have one source instance submit data to any number of targets. So that means like if you have one, let's say, uh, tracker instance, and you would like to, to, to kind of produce the aggregate monthly summary, for instance, and send it to you know, your HMS, your HIV, your, your data portal, your data warehouse, whatever, there can be any number of targets, but just one source. But of course, if you have many sources, you just set up another source on that source instance. So there's no limitation there, I would say. It's, it's, it, there's no limitation, except that there's, there's only one source. The, the whole thing sits on the source. So that, of course, that means there can only be one source, but there can be any number of target instances that that source instance can send data to. And you're, of course, also free to, to set this up as as many indices to instances as you want. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm particularly interested in the cross-cut application, um, and I actually have a few questions about that. Um, like accessibility, travel time estimations, something that is now we've been doing with other software. Yep. So, first thing I want to understand, like how much flexibility is there with regards to travel scenario assumptions? So, because that could be quite different from country, right, depending on the type of road or like speed limits and things like that. And um, secondly, I want to ask like how like, like how often can we regenerate those results? Roads get built all the time, there's changes in land use and so on. Yeah, yeah. Good, good question. Good. Good. And like to be completely honest, I'm not an expert on this. Uh, I know this more from a high level. Um, and I know that with all these kind of global solutions, there will always be, you know, problem sometimes with the, the local context in some country right so i don't to be honest i don't really know how accurate it is for every country right uh, but these guys like we have a good we have a good collaboration with them uh, and they're quite happy to support dhs too because of course they know that they can get reached for their service when they say i do recommend that you can actually reach out to them and ask uh, when it comes to like the details of their service is crosscut.io i think you can reach out to them directly we can or just copy us we can provide the introduction to them and they can put you in touch directly to get the details about how exactly how it works. Uh, I only know this from, from a high level. <laughs> so if you have to find the details. Um, the other question, like how often can I do this? I don't think there's any limitation. It's quite fast. Uh, I want to show you one thing. So if you go to the apps, uh, sorry, the app hub, then there's uh, an app for this. So you can see there's a CrossCut application that you can go and install. So, so this application is essentially a, a UI on top of their service that can be integrated within DHS2. Uh, and this is, is where you can do this upload of uh, facility coordinates and then you get back the boundaries. Uh, and this, I don't think there's any kind of limitation on how often you can do that. You can do it whenever you want, I would say. It only takes a few minutes uh, for the process to complete. And I believe the service is free if you refer to us and say you're using it for DHS2. I believe they will give it to you for free. Uh, that's my understanding. Um, so just refer to us and, and uh, <laughs> we'll talk to them. Um, but again, only takes a few minutes. This is, this is then saved as coordinates on this secondary attribute that we call, that I talked about, like the method attribute with GeoJSON. And you can just update that, I think, as often as you want. Thanks, that's a good Thanks. question. Yeah, that was a good question. Anything else? Sarab in the back. <laughs> Uh, I have two questions. One is regarding the offline uh, analytics for Android. Uh, so, will it be linked with the data entry app as well? Like, we can log in up to key users, or it will be a one with the user. And uh, the second one is for personal access tokens. Uh, so, if we want to limit the access to particular APIs, so it will be controlled uh, to the sharing settings, uh, the same user rules. Of uh, what was the last question? Um, uh, for personal access tokens, uh, oh, yeah. access to be limited to the APIs to the same user rules? Uh, yeah, great question, great question. So the first one uh, was about analytics. So the thing is, like, there's only one Android application now. Like, um, so we only have the capture of Android application. It can do data entry, tracker, analytics. It's all in one app. 
So, so everything we talked about here in terms of this uh, multi-user, um, it actually, this, this, this one app. So this really applies to data entry, tracker, capture, analytics. It's all the same thing. So yes, the answer is yes. It does apply to data entry also. Um, so that's quite nice. The other one about um, access tokens. So we talked about this thing called, uh, let me just go back here super quick. So we talked about uh, access tokens. This was a very good question. I really forgot to mention that. So the question was, um, how about access control? And the, the solution is that, sorry, the answer is, the access control is linked to the user account behind the access token. So when you create the access token, um, the access token will be associated with the user that creates the token. And the access control will be inherited from the user account that created the token. So the same sharing applies. So like if your user has access to, you know, do uh, these data elements and that indicator and, and analytics API or whatever, the, the, the access control will be the same for the, for the access token, essentially. It's a very good question. So when it comes to like creating these web portals, for instance, we really recommend that you create a minimal user account, like a good, a good principle for security is to give people the least permissions they need. So if you're creating this kind of public web portal and you're exposing this thing essentially to the public, you should be careful and you should only give as little authority as you need, um, like just analytics API, just the data elements you'd like to expose, et cetera. Uh, and that you can control by giving sharing access to the user who created this token. And again, like if you're creating a public web portal, we, we recommend that you create a dedicated user for that, like a data portal user in DHSD, and then you create an access token for that user. Okay. Good question. I have, I have a question on JHS and Limitations. Uh, what's the number of decimals in the number of decimals or recommended number of decimals and the number of nodes, maximum nodes in general? Uh, I mean, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, question was, and this is about when you import, I would say, geospatial data into DHS2, right? Yeah. Yeah, so how many decimals? I think it really, I mean, good question. Um, so this is really about what they call like simplification of geometries, right? So sometimes when you go to a shapefile, you can see that the shapefile can be really large, maybe like a gigabyte, you know, and contains a lot of ge ge geospatial data. Uh, what you sometimes see with the DHS2 Maps application, which is online, is that it sometimes becomes too heavy, right? You've probably seen that. So if you take like a, you know, shapefile from GDAL, and then it's like, oh God, like it's, you know, 80 megabyte download to, to upload the district, to load the district layer, right? So that's when we do something called simplification. So you simplify the geometry before we import uh, to find a nice balance between detail and loading time. And I would say like, if you have know, four decimals should be more than enough, right? I mean, this is like public health It's not NASA, right? And don't really care if it's like one meter away from the <laughs> street or not. So I would say it's up to you, but I would say three, four decimals should be more than enough, maybe five for, for public health use cases, right? Once again, you don't really care if the facility is one meter or left or right. So something like that. And I think when it comes to the simplification of polygons, you also try to find a reasonable balance. So again, you don't need like every little, you know, corner and detail in the boundaries for public health reasons. There's no need to do that. Again, we're not NASA, right? So try to find the balance between like, creating a visually appealing map and have a, when, you, when you load the GIS application, the maps application, you can also re-inspect the responses in the browser to see how heavy it is, like how many megabytes. If it's like 10 megabytes to load it, that means a lot of end users on bad connections will suffer. So you need to make a good judgment and find the balance between details on the map and how much bandwidth and time it takes for people in the field to, to load it. Uh, last. Yeah. One more question. Happened at the Last year's year, so you can always catch it. No worries. So I have a question about the Replic Pro. This can be used for sharing messages, right? And the chat and also link to the WhatsApp as well. I understand. So 
I like to know if it can be used to share voice message and video, and if it can be used to provide counseling, nutrition counseling, that like dietitian counseling. Yeah. If it can be, then it will be very useful for the law of them. Right, right, right. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, I will refer to more on the details here, but I, we, we don't really integrate at the message level yet. So the messages still remains in rapid growth. Um, so we only at the moment support contacts in aggregate numbers. Uh, so I don't think we, we kind of allow for importing the actual messages and things like video and so on. That might come in the future. Uh, it might also make sense to just leave that in rapid growth, uh, but uh, maybe Morton wants to comment uh, in the details. Yeah, so um, the specifics, um, I don't know, I've given it to you, so I want to say a little more about that. But in, in general, um, we're going to put a lot of sort of workflows in terms of communications. So uh, it's not really meant to be first to first interaction, it is more of a person to system interaction. So you might have a workflow saying, um, uh, today I saw a Talking about all the things that are happening, for example, so maybe there's a hotel in my own, for example, and then you can ask this in the kind of system, we will ask you what the cross address, this is the action is coming for, or you can send some data, the system says something or something in correct format, and you can send the answer to the file. When it comes to video, so I, I don't really know, honestly. I mean, you can use WhatsApp as one of the channels, but I don't think you can react to a video that is something you can probably can store it. Um, I don't just try to leave my kid on that, but in general, it's not many kind of process cases. Uh, but there are some other ways to do that, that's for sure. Yeah. Okay, so I start for the, the good update of the HRC and the new features. I hope um, if you have any questions about or if you us, you please find us doing the debrief and upstream. Yeah, and then before we break up, I want to give the mic to you. Too. She has some announcement. Good morning. I, uh, yesterday, unfortunately, we cannot make the Baladuma outside because it's warming. So, because of hotel prepare, everything is not possible. So, but we eat a lot of fresh food and we could not eat it. So the hotel very kindly offer us another gala dinner tonight for free. Uh, so um, they are very, very generous uh, because maybe some of you don't know that this resident belongs to our ex friends. <laughs> So uh, tonight we will repeat the Valadina again and they us say the PM is that all right. <laughs> okay, so um uh, that's the announcement for today. Thank you.